or more. Amen. Good to be with you this morning. Good to be in the presence of the Lord. And uh, uh, it's been, I'm going to say, a while. Not a, not a long while, but a, but a while since I felt, beginning the service this Sunday, what I felt just before we, we started in Sunday school this morning. And, oh, that's so precious to me. Amen. And I, I say before all, Lord, your pres presence is precious to me. I do not take it for granted. Amen. Romans, the 10th chapter. What did I do? We'll just begin reading at the first verse. This is the Apostle Paul writing, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And of course, Paul was a Jew, uh, and he was a, once a persecutor of the church, but then he, was, he met Jesus. He was struck down on the road to Damascus, and he received Jesus. And he was transformed. And the one that would kill and imprison those who had the testimony of Christ became one who was ever willing to lay down his life for the testimony of Christ. But he had a great love for Israel, great love for his brethren, according to the flesh, and sometimes he would use that term. He says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Do you know you can have a zeal for God and absolutely not know God? You believe that? You know, sincerity is not, it's not the whole of everything. You can be sincerely wrong. How many have ever been sincerely wrong? I've been sincerely wrong. I, we don't like to even make the comparison, but those guys that flew those planes in, into the towers, what was it, uh, 19 years ago, were sincere. You don't do that. You don't do that to the point of it costing you your life without being sincere. But they were sincere following an abomination. They were sincerely uh, evil. They were sincerely wrong. And this is what Paul is speaking of so much of Israel of his day, he said, they have a zeal of God. They, they go, uh, it's like Jesus spoke. He said, you will cross land and sea to make one proselyte, a convert. He said, but when you've made him, you've made him twofold the child of hell as yourself. He said, you, 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 you gave him what you have, but what you have is not worth having. Now that sounds harsh. But that was the truth. He, he was, and Jesus was bringing that out. But Paul said they have a zeal of God. They not only are sincere, they have a, a, a fervency to do something for the Lord. He said, but not according to knowledge. He said, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. Now we may read more in this, in this chapter if the Lord take us there this morning, but I, as I was uh, Praying was up here for prayer service uh, yesterday evening, and and uh, the the Lord brought me to this scripture. Just that 
first phrase almost, they being ignorant of the righteousness of God. And ignorant doesn't mean that you're dumb. Ignorant doesn't mean uh, that your IQ is low. Ignorant simply means Paul in this same chapter said, well, how will they believe in whom they've not heard? Ignorant just means that, that for one reason or the other, the person doesn't know this thing, whatever they're ignorant of. In, in Ephesians, the, the apostle will say that they're, they're separated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. They, they don't know. It's that which they don't know. Maybe it's because they've never been told or maybe because they wouldn't listen. And, you know, uh, if you sit to, through math class and don't listen, you won't know. How many found that out? Uh, if you uh, go to sleep, uh, you go to sleep in literature, you won't know. You'll be ignorant to when test day comes. And I found that out. I discovered that. And, and there's many reasons for ignorance. And the, the first, you, you, maybe you've never been told, if you've never considered it, but maybe you were told and you closed your ears, you closed your eyes and you wouldn't con consider it. To, whatever the case was, he says they're ignorant of God's righteousness. And so they're going about to, to establish their own righteousness. And, and that phrase just jumped out and grabbed me about being ignorant of God's righteousness. Uh, we, there was a, a man that Brother Josh uh, brought uh, Wednesday night. He was in service and he, he wanted to talk to me. And, you know, he's got some se severe, uh, uh, you know, issues, problems going on in his life. And he just, uh, he just, told me, he said, I, I just want to, I want something better. And so I just began to talk to him about the Lord and about the, the promise uh, and, uh, of the gospel of Christ uh, that he said that you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And he asked me this question. He said, well, you know, I just want to know am I saved or not? And I said, well, I'm not going to answer that question for you. And he, he just looked at me. I said, I said, maybe I'll do that later. Maybe we'll talk about that later. I'm not going to answer that question for you. And I said, I'm going to tell you why. I said, because if a man is drowning in the ocean and, they're, and they're, they're, they're sinking and they're going down for the last time and they're crying for help and someone saves them, they know what they're saved from. How many would know what you're saved from? They're saved from drowning in, in, the, in, in the waves and beneath the sea. They're saved from that. And, and, and so they know what saved is. They know what it means. I said, if a man's uh, uh, in a burning building and, the, and there seems to be no way out and the flames are closing in and they're crying for help and, they, and they're... they're, they're fear that death is at hand and then the, the fireman breaks through the, the window and he has a ladder and he gets them out and he saves them. They know what they're saved from. They understand that. They know what they're saved from and they know what saved is. They're saved from the flames. They're saved from the fires. And I could go on and on. The person that been kidnapped, taken hostage, uh, you know, for uh, and 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 fear for his life. Uh, you know, if the if the SWAT team shows up uh, and they take out the 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 uh, hostage holder and they deliver him from that dire situation, they know what they're saved from and they know what saved is. But. For some reason, when we walk through the doors of the church house and we say, I'm saved, it's not saved from anything. They say, well, that means I'm going to heaven. And we completely lose the, the meaning of it, what it's all about. We're ignorant. 
We're ignorant of what the Word of God says. And that's how he starts this passage, being ignorant of righteousness, is a prayer that they might be saved. And I tell you, I said when a person is saved, they know what they're saved from. And they know what the Lord delivered them from. They know what God brought them out of. It's not just to say to, yes, I'm saved unto the Lord. I'm redeemed to the Lord. And yes, heaven is my home. But I know what He delivered me from. I know what He brought me out of. And, and so we, we take the word, so simple, word like saved, and in our religious dogma and wisdom, we, we make it a meaningless word. It means nothing. It means I, I went through the form and the ritual, I'm on the way to heaven, and no, Wonder there's no rejoicing and no thanksgiving and no praise. I tell you, I tell you, 37 years later, it's just as real. It's just as real. I remember the mire and the darkness and the pit and the shame. And it's just as real. And it causes just as much rejoicing today. But he said they're ignorant. Of God's righteousness. They don't know. They don't understand. And I want to talk a little bit about God's righteousness and what He will say later in this chapter when He says, With a heart, a man, a woman, a person believes under righteousness. What that means. What that means. But you'll never believe under righteousness if you're ignorant of God's righteousness. There's a passage of Scripture, and it's 1 John, the third chapter. And it's the seventh verse. And the eighth verse, I want to read this. It's a very strong and almost shocking verse to many people. There... Is something I've heard all my life, and I fix to say I don't know where it came from. I do know where it came from. It it's a deception. It's it's one of those things that people took hold of, and they felt so wise about it, and yet it wasn't based in the Scripture. It wasn't based in the Word of God. It wasn't based in the truth. And it was this idea that in salvation we're given a righteousness that only God can see. And it comes in many different forms and many different doctrines. It's, it's, it's an imputed righteousness, and what is taught is that it's in the eyes of God. How many have ever heard something like that? I'm just going to be, just heard that. It's an imputed righteousness. And so we're taught that that is the righteousness we receive in salvation, the righteousness we receive in Christ. And it, it, for me to speak contrary to that, I'm going to tell you, you right now, I'm, I'm speaking contrary to uh, a line of theologians that would, that would wrap around this world. But we're going to say what the Word of God says. And the Apostle John, in in this third chapter of John, is a powerful, powerful chapter. And it can be used to bring life or it can be used to bring death. And I want to to say this not only to to a a person that maybe is one that I've never heard these things, but to ministers of the gospel. Be careful you don't take the Word of God to kill with, because you can do that. Be careful that you don't do that. And I've seen people that they think their mission is is to to prove to everyone they meet that they're lost. And, and, And that's not sent of God. Jesus, our mission is is to give them the gospel. 
that will give them life. And that's the mission of the gospel. It's not to, 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 to destroy, it's to give life. And sometimes the gospel will destroy false hope. It will destroy uh, 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 erroneous things that people have held to. But in this seventh verse, the Apostle John starts out with this statement, little children... So this is not some deep theology for those that have been so long in the Lord and the ways of the Lord are are so mature that they've reached this certain level. But he's writing to little children. And he says this, let no man deceive you. Well, what would they be trying to deceive you about? He that does righteousness is righteous. Even as he, even as Christ is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil. Now, I just read what the Apostle John said, and there's already, there's already someone, and, and believe me, I haven't seen anything in this congregation, but there's already someone that said, I don't like, I don't like what he's teaching. I'm not teaching, I'm reading. There is a difference. How do we understand the difference? I'm not teaching, I'm reading. Now, I'm not giving a disclaimer because I believe it. But that's what the Word of God says. And he thought it important enough to say, let no man deceive you. Didn't he say that? Now, why would he say, let no man deceive you? Because someone was trying to deceive him. Someone was trying to deceive him. It's like the word saved. Will you? Use it every day or in, in, in common language. We know what it means. But somehow we get to the church house and they tell us that's not what it means. It's not, it doesn't mean that you're rescued from something. When, G, when the angel said you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Uh, well, you mean he delivers us from sin? Oh, that's not what it means. It is what it means. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It it says what it means, and it means what it says. And you can just read it. But so often we're ignorant of it. Well, here he says, let no man deceive you. Don't deceive you. You know in the world, if if someone in the world, why is this? Someone in the world uh, walks up to you, and they lie to you. They stand bald face, and they lie to you. What are they? You know that. You know that. But the preacher stands in the pulpit and he lies to you. And oh, he's not a liar. He's not a liar. Or someone, they're they're not, don't say that. And and we put, you know, a, a difference between us and the world. We understand it in the world. We don't understand it when we step into the church house. And Paul's just, Uh, John's just bringing out something so simple. You know it in the world. You know it in life. Uh, Don't let anyone deceive you to tell you it's not the same in the Gospel. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And he that commits sin is of the devil. And you say that to somebody... And the silence is deafening. And I just read it from the Scripture. If we're going to be those that carry a gospel, that we that carry it are not ignorant of God's righteousness, and that those that we speak to and then are not ignorant of God's righteousness. We've got to quit apologizing for every verse of Scripture we come to. Stop apologizing for the Word of God. Stop. If I read the rest of this chapter, you know, uh, half Christian people in the world be crawling under their, crawling under their seat. And so we just don't read it. We just, we just put it out. And no wonder we're ignorant of God's righteousness. We're ignorant 
of what the Word of God says. And we're ignorant of what Christ has promised to, to do. And if we're ignorant, we're alienated from the life of God. Well, there's another passage of Scripture. I don't believe that I've marked it. But I want to read it. 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. I did mark it. I'm reading. You say, this is strong this morning. Keith, this is not your usual service. Well, it's what the Lord gave me this morning. But I'm reading. And I want, that's important to note. I'm reading. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? I didn't make that up. Well, but we, we have a righteousness even though we still sin and continue to do these things and we will inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it says. All right, wait a minute. He says, be not deceived. I'm reading. Neither fornicator, idolater, adulterer, effeminate, abuser themselves with mankind, nor thief, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Not going to happen. You say, in what situation does it happen? In no situation does it happen. He said, don't be deceived. It's not going to happen. Don't be ignorant of the righteousness of God. Don't apologize for the Word of God. And because you don't like a, a passage of Scripture, don't just put it out of your mind. Don't just put it out because I promise you uh, it will still say it and it's still the Word of God. And you say, Keith, you, pre you, you preach as someone self-righteous. Uh, you preach as someone uh, that, that thinks uh, you're, you're, you're the mark, you're the goal. No, I preach as someone that he writes here, he says, such were some of you. Such, and I was the chiefest. And someone else might say, move over, Keith. I was the chiefest. And we'll have to disagree about that. But such were some of you. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. So you're not unrighteous and you're not no longer an adulterer or a fornicator or a covetous or a thief. You're no longer these things, though you were. Don't be ignorant of God's righteousness. Such were. That breaks my heart. When John writes, Behold, what manner of love is this the Father's bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Why does that break your heart? Because I was the unclean. I was the vile. I was the deceiver. That's why it breaks my heart. I mean, if I had, could, would have been one I mean, uh, that said none of these things have ever come into my life, none of these things have ever happened to me. Uh, you know, you know, I've, I, I was the, the 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 good one, the perfect one, the honorable one. All these things, uh, and then the Lord, uh, you know, come to me, and I could say, you made a good choice. I can't say that. What manner of love is this the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? Beloved, now are we. The sons of God. But he said, don't be ignorant. Understand these things. That these things that he says, and I'm not here to, 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 to beat on people, but a covetous man in the world and a covetous man in the church, there's no difference before God. There's no difference. You know, a liar in the world and a liar in the church, there's no difference before God. Let's don't, let's don't 
take God's righteousness and cast it to the ground. Have you ever read, I believe it's Matthew 5, where Jesus spoke. He said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of God. And that was Jesus that, that, that spoke that. And these were those, they kept uh, all the, the law and the ritualism and the, and the uh, sacrifices and the works and the, and the tithes and, and all these things. And you say, well, no one's righteousness can be more than theirs. I tell you, a child in Christ has more righteousness than they had. A babe in Christ has more righteousness than those Pharisees had. And Jesus explains it. He, he, he explains it. He said, he says for, he says, you've heard you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that those that look upon, he that looks upon a woman to, to lust after in her heart has committed adultery. The Pharisee didn't get, commit adultery, but his heart was full of lust. There's a righteousness that exceeds that. It's called a clean heart and a right spirit. Amen. Jesus, you know, said it's, written, Thou shalt not kill. He said, I say to you that if you're angry without a cause, you're in danger of judgment. What's he saying? He, he's telling you, well, I didn't kill. I handled the situation uh, correctly and, 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 and rightly. And, and you lash with the tongue and you, and you, and you, you hate on the inside and bitterness and all those things are within. He's telling you there's a greater righteousness. There's a righteousness that fills the heart with love. There's a hot righteousness that fills the heart with forgiveness. There's a righteousness that fills the heart with compassion for those that have wronged you. But don't be ignorant of God's righteousness. And he, he, because he said, if, if, if you don't find something that's a whole lot better than what that Pharisee has, you won't enter the kingdom of God. I want to ask you about Paul the Apostle. This this one that began as a persecutor of the church and then became uh, one that we would consider the greatest of apostles. But I want you to consider this. He wrote the church at Philippi and he talks about before coming to Christ. He talks about being a Hebrew, a Hebrew. He talks about being a, a Pharisee. He wasn't using that in a bad sense. We think Pharisee and we think hypocrite. No, the Pharisee was the one that was the most diligent, the most diligent to do everything that Moses said. He says, I was a Pharisee. And then he said, touching the righteousness which is by the law, I was blameless. Now, how many have heard, have been, people try to tell you, well, Paul had a sin problem. You heard that? Well, he said, because the evil that I would not, that I do. If you'll read the early part of the chapter, he'll tell you that he's describing himself under the law. He said, well, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. He talks about the struggle uh, under the law to serve God. And yet he was blameless. Do you think that he gave that up because someone promised him a righteousness? Uh, oh, well, you may, you may be immoral every once in a while, but, but it'll be okay. And uh, you uh, may curse someone out uh, day to day, but it'll be okay. You may be a thief. You, you, you give up. Uh, you just give up that blameless thing. You see, he saw a righteousness uh, that made his blamelessness 
to the law to be nothing because it was his actions, it wasn't his heart. It wasn't his heart. It wasn't a, a change within him. And if it's not changed within you, it will always be a struggle. It will always be a, a, a effort and a falling and a laboring to do it. Someone asked me one time, and I don't know why I said this, it just popped out. Someone asked me one time, I preached the gospel, and they, they come up, you saying you don't sin? I said, you saying you don't slap your mother? And you say, well, I would never. How many would say I would never slap my mother? You kids, you better get your hands up, because mother might slap you. I can say that. I would never slap my mother. Why? It's just not in your heart. You say you've got enough power not to slap your mother. It's just not in your heart. Is it in your heart to lash out and curse someone? Is it in your heart to, to cheat to, on your wife? Is it in your heart to, to, to do these manner of things? Don't be ignorant of God's righteousness. Romans. I had marked this, but let's go there. Romans 5. Was that 19? For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. How many believe that? Do you believe that? In the 12th verse, he said, By one man sin entered the world, death by sin. Adam, that old Adam. Wouldn't you like to get a hold of Adam? What a mess you made of this place. And we accept. I mean, there's some that don't. I, I, we'll get emails all the time, responses. Well, we don't believe that people are, are born of sinners. We don't believe that in the sin nature. We don't believe in all that. I said, well, if the word of God's true, that says all have sinned. If it's true, and it is true. And whether you call it a nature or not, it must be natural. Can you see that? You say, well, it's not the nature. Well, then what is it? If every one of us, Scripture says we're given 70, and if we're blessed 80, and, and sometimes you see people above 100 and 115. So, so we put the mark, say by 120, all of us die. I guess we'd have to accept that's natural, wouldn't we? Happens every time. Something happened in the fall. See, I don't believe that a child is born evil. I don't believe that a child is born wicked. I don't believe that a child is born uh, guilty, but I do believe that a child is born with that same seed that we're all born with. And it's the same seed that, that takes hold and grows. And, and, and before long, parents, uh, you're having to deal with that seed. You're having to deal with selfishness. You're having to deal with the fits. You're having to deal with the, all these kind of things. And a child left to itself still brings mother to shame. Still does. And it's something that's natural. And you can trace it back to the fall of humanity in the transgression. 
And one man, disobedience, many were made sinners. And most of us accept that, understand that, and believe that. But what about the rest of the verse? I'm reading, folks. I'm reading. It says, so, so by the obedience of one. Who's that one? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Shall many be what? Made righteous. Well, that's only in the eyes of God. Well, were we only sinners in the eyes of God? I mean, did Adam? He's using a direct comparison here. One man brought us down. Another man brought us up. One man brought sin in. One another man took sin out. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He does. And don't apologize for what the Word of God says. Don't be ignorant of God's righteousness. I want to go back to my text, and this is probably where we'll end up this morning in the 10th chapter. They be ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is something you will submit to. You will give yourself to. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Not the end of righteousness. End of the law for righteousness. In the previous chapter, he said Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, did not obtain to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but by the works of the law. So I want you to see this. A nation of people for 1,500 years striving to fulfill the law of righteousness and could not even do that. And father learns how many fathers teach your children some of the missteps to avoid some of the missteps you've taken? I hope you do. We don't have to learn everything the hard way, do we? Some of the missteps you took. Well, I want you to see this. Father teaching children and children teaching their children for 1,500 years. And never obtaining righteousness. But in that previous chapter, as he closes out, he said, but the Gentiles who, which followed not after righteousness. That's you and me. And it was those in his day that had believed the gospel unto him. They followed not after the law of righteousness. He said they obtained it. They obtained it, but not through the works of law, but by the faith of Christ. They believed the gospel, and it transformed them. You see, I'm not here this morning to, pre to give you a to-do list. I'm not here to give you something that didn't work for Israel for 1,500 years. I'm not here to tell you, well, you know these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, so this is how you're going to keep yourself. If they couldn't do it for 1,500 years, you can't do it for your 70 or 80 or 90. You can't. But the unrighteous will still will not inherit the kingdom of God. Doesn't change that. Don't be ignorant of God's righteousness. Then what are you saying? That we're all going to be lost? No. This chapter that people are rushed through and say, you said this, you did this, you're on your way to heaven. You're saved and you're going, you're scratching your head. Saved from what? This chapter is telling you how you can have a righteousness 
that is not a labor, it's a pure heart. It's a righteous spirit. Isn't that what David asked for? If, didn't he cry he, after his great sin with Bathsheba and Uriah? And in agony, he cried out before God. But then he said, I was shaped in iniquity and conceived in sin. You know what David is saying? He's not making excuses. He's saying, God, God, they didn't know it, but I've always, I've always had this in me. They didn't know it, but it's always been there. It was well covered. I didn't know if you knew it, God, but it's always been there. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. He, though not knowing, was laying the terms of redemption. That God, in His mercy upon Fallen humanity would do such a work that it would create in them a clean heart and renew in them what had been sold so long ago, a righteous spirit. That's what a right spirit is. Same word, a righteous spirit. Romans 10, for Moses describes the righteousness with the law. This is how they tried to get it. He said, you do these things. Well, you come to church, you give your tithes, you go to Bible study, and you, and you do it, and hopefully one day it'll kick in. In. The righteousness of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in that heart, who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down? You know why it doesn't say that? See, there was one called Christ who was promised by the angel Gabriel to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. I'm not reading because it's not in front of me. I'm quoting, though. This Messiah, the Prince, would make an end of sin Make reconciliation for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness. And someone says, I'll be so glad when he comes again. He said, don't say that. Amen. Don't say that. When he comes again, he's going to make an end of sin in me. Don't say that. It'll never happen. Don't say who will bring Christ down from above. Why? Christ has come. Christ has come. Don't say who in the sweet by and by. Don't say when we all get to heaven. Don't say when I lay this carnal body down. Don't say who will bring Christ down from Christ has come. And He has shed His blood to take away the sin of the world. So it says, who shall ascend in the deep to bring up Christ again from the dead? Well, we know he came and he died. And I wish he would come again. Don't say that. If you're looking to the future for salvation, you look in vain. If you look to the future for freedom in your heart and in your spirit, you look in in vain. If you look for death to do it, you look in vain. If you look for the rapture to do it, you look in vain. If you look for the second coming to do it, you look in vain. Don't say who will bring Christ down. Don't say who will bring Him up. Why? Because He came down from heaven, born of a virgin, lived among men, shed His blood upon a cross to deliver you, and came out of the grave in victory tree. So if you look into the future, you're ignorant of God's righteousness. He said, but what saith it? The word is nigh. It's close to you. You remember Jesus told one, he says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. 
It's close to you. It's not a long way off. It's not way out in the future. It's not in the sweet by and by. He said, the word is nigh you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. What do you mean? He's saying, the key is in your mouth and in your heart. The key. What do you mean the key? He said, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not talking about a form you go through in this place. Though you may do it in a church house. But open your mouth. And say, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ who came down from heaven to take away my sin, to make me free. I believe in you. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. It's not something he has to do. It's something he has finished for you. For with the heart. A man, a woman. Some would say me. Me. I. Believe unto righteousness. What what are you saying, preacher? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Well, let's don't jump over that word. We talked about saved. And the word saved in the Greek they used and in our language, actually means to rescue, deliver. So salvation is what? It's that work that rescues and delivers us. And Robin, I'm closing. But it's the power of God and the salvation to every one who what? Believes it. But you cannot believe it and apologize for it. You cannot believe it and make excuses for it. That person that says, well, I believe we'll always be sinners and we'll always sin and struggle with sin is right as long as they believe that. You need to understand that. If that's what you believe, then you're right. As long as you believe that. You say, but Brother Keith, I know I'm still a sinner. There's darkness, unclean things in my heart. Am I just to stand here and say, like others say, just start Confessing, I'm the righteousness of God. I'm the righteousness of God. No. But you begin to believe and stand upon the what the Word of God says. You know, one of the things that God gave me understanding of. 30 years ago that helped me so much.
He spoke to me that if the gospel that's recorded in the scripture condemns me and sends me to hell, it's still the truth and it will save everyone that believes it. You say, how did that help you? Because then I understood it wasn't up to me. It was up to him. See, I had begun taking upon myself, well, I've got to, to, to bear the burden of, of proving this to everybody. And then I saw what the scripture said, if we believe not, he abides faithful. Doesn't change anything. I'd rather believe. Someone tells me, well, God just doesn't don't, don't do what you say. You mean what I read? And I say to them, I'm sure glad he got to me before you did. I hear those that speak of how hard it is to serve God. And hear me, I understand trials. I understand going through the fire. But tell me how hard it is to serve God. And I'm saying, what are you talking about? Peter said, you're in heaviness through manifold temptation. Yet in believing you rejoice. with joy unspeakable. I hope we've made some sense this morning. And I trust every one of us will consider that this is what the Word of God says. I've had to fight with the Word of God before. With things the Word of God said, I, I would say, can't be, can't be, can't be, can't be. But God, you're true. You said, let God be true and every man a liar. And I will believe you. And if you do, you can be free. Free from the things that trouble your heart, your mind, your thoughts. Free to serve God. Let's stand this morning. I'm very thankful. I mean, say, every time I read that, such were some of you. I remember me. And I'm thankful, Jesus. Well, let's gather this morning. Let's just gather. We just come stand here in front of, across the front and thank the Lord this morning. Holy Jesus. Lord, I was ignorant of your righteousness. I was ignorant of your ways. I was ignorant of you. And still, you reach down to me. And all, 
my arrogance. I was arrogant. In all my arrogance, you reached down to me. And you gave me what 1,500 years in religion couldn't give Israel. And you gave me what so many struggle for and cannot find. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. It's a free gift. Those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Shall reign in life by Jesus Christ. And I thank you. I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. But I don't know why you reach down to me. I don't know why I'm like David. Why would you consider me? Why would you have compassion upon me? So foolish was I. That you would give such an unspeakable gift. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. We have any needs this morning? Glory to the Lord. Oh, Savior. My Savior. You know, this same Lord that saves, that delivers, that rescues. You will find that He will walk with you. He will provide for you. 